Hi, my name is Athanas Tujarov, I'm a CG specialist here at Chaos Group, and today I'm very excited to present to you Virian Next with 3ds Max. If I had to describe Virian Next in three words, they would be smarter, faster, and more powerful. These are not just words, there's actual software behind them, and uh, let's take a look. Here's a list of some of the major features and improvements. Virian Next is smarter because it can now gather scene intelligence, and because of that we're able to develop lots of new tools like the adaptive dome light, the physical camera and its auto settings for exposure and white balance, the NVIDIA AI denoiser, the denoising of render elements, and all of these things make Virian faster, but Virian Next is not just faster because of features, but because of code optimization as well. As a baseline, it will speed up your overall rendering by up to 25%. The GPU is also improved in terms of speed and UI. I'll get to that later and explain everything in detail. Virian Next is more powerful because of all the GPU improvements listed here, the new hair shader, the lighting analysis, the alembic workflows, and so on. Before I explain how everything works and show you practical examples, I would like to explain something else first, since it's probably the first thing that you're going to notice when you install Virian Next. When choosing your render, you will have two different rendering engines to choose from, Virian Next and Virian GPU Next. Virian Next is the CPU rendering engine, and as the name suggests, V-Ray GPU Next is the GPU rendering engine. When you buy V-Ray, you get both as a package. Even though they produce comparable results, they're different and should be treated as such. They're both production ready and have distributed rendering in IPR, but produce slightly different results. Now that that's out of the way, let's start with the first in the category of smart improvements, the adaptive dome light. When I say new adaptive dome light, I mean that the adaptive part is new. At first glance it's exactly the same, but under the hood is greatly improved. There is an adaptive option and when you enable it, VR will analyze the scene and choose which areas of the dome light are important for lighting and sample only these areas. Unimportant areas will be ignored and that will result in quite a dramatic speed and accuracy improvement. Let me jump into Max and show you how it works. Ok, so I have an interior scene here that is already lit with the V-Ray Sun in the Skylight Portal. It's a popular setup that works well in most cases, however there's another way to light an interior scene and that's by using the dome light with an HDR. And it's a very popular setup as well, it uh, produces great results but it can sometimes be a bit slower to render. And that's where the adaptive dome light comes in. Now the great thing about the adaptive dome light is that it doesn't need a Skylight Portal, so I can just disable it or delete it, it doesn't really matter. Let me just show you how the whole thing works. I'm going to disable the sunlight and the portal light because, I, like I said, I don't need it. And then I'm just going to do a quick render just to see where we're at right now. And, uh, yeah, this is not a very pretty result, but I bet that I can turn it around in just a second. So let me just select the dome light and apply an HDR map into the texture slot. Ok, so that looks much much better. And uh, I still haven't enabled the adaptive dome light, so I'm going to do that now. And uh, let me just compare the before and after the adaptive option. So I'm going to save this render in the history. So I have something to compare the new render to. I'm, I'm going to make a new one. And it should be very quick. And as you can see there's still a lot of noise in the image, but the whole point of this is just to show you how much quicker the adaptive dome light is. So I'm going to save this result as well. And I'm going to set up a wipe here. This is going to be my A and this is going to be my B. And if I zoom in, you can see how much less noise the adaptive option has here on the carpet and uh, basically everywhere you look you'll see less noise. And if I leave this for a little bit longer it, it's going to be basically noiseless. So let me just show you the, the noise result, see what it looks like. And uh, that's actually not too bad, it, I, I really like it. And the cool thing is that I can start the IPR and just start changing the settings of the dome light or I can rotate it or rotate the horizontal rotation as I'm going to do right now. And that's going to basically give me a completely different result. It's the same HDR, but by rotating it, I can get different results and basically different lighting setups. So that's the adaptive dome light. 
The only question that now remains is how much the speed improvement. Well, it depends on your scene and HDR. What we have found in our tests is that it can be up to 7 times. I have a couple of examples here that show typical results. Here, it's 2 times the speed improvement. And in the next example, I have chosen a different HDR and the speed increase is 4 times. So, like I said, it all depends on your scene and HDR. Ok, so next I'm going to take a look at the V-Ray physical camera. It's back and all of its settings have been rearranged, I'm going to show you in a second. And we also have auto exposure and white balance. So let me just jump straight into Max. And I'm just going to render and see what kind of result I get. That's way overexposed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the render. I'm not gonna even let it finish. And then I'm gonna show you the V-Ray physical camera. Just let me select it. And this is the V-Ray physical camera, not the Max physical camera. And as you can see here, all the settings have been rearranged. And now everything is in categories. So if I want stuff related to the sensor and lens, I can find it in one place. Same for the aperture settings. Same for the depth of field and motion blur color and exposure we have here, vignetting, white balance, we have some other settings out there. And what if I want to change the exposure? Well, I can go into the aperture settings and ch change the film speed, f number, shutter speed, but what if I don't know what these things actually do? What if I don't know the theory behind them? Well, uh, Vera can help me here. I can basically go into the Vera settings, into the camera settings, and find auto exposure and white balance. And if I want my exposure problems fixed, I can just enable the auto exposure and render and see what happens. Okay, so that fixed it. Now, without even changing any of these settings here, I was able to fix the exposure. Well, very fixed it for me. So what if I want V-Ray to fix the white balance as well? Well, I can simply go into the camera settings again and click on Auto Exposure and White Balance checkbox and just do another render. And by the looks of it, that fixed my problems with the white balance as well. So that's great. Without knowing anything about the camera and without knowing any camera settings, I was able to fix my exposure and white balance problems. Now that I'm happy with my results, I can transfer the settings that Vera figured out for me to the physical camera. To do that, I need to go to the camera settings again and click on transfer to camera button. That will change the film speed setting and the white balance temperature. Now that I've transferred my settings, I can make changes to them if I want, and in this case I'm going to make them even numbers. If I render now, the camera settings will still have no effect because the auto settings are still enabled. If I disable them, the very physical camera settings will take effect. The auto exposure and white balance work in animation as well. I have a test render here to show you some results. Ok, so let's move on to denoising. Like I said before, we now support the NVIDIA AI denoiser. And the great thing about this denoiser is that it's very quick. It can denoise an image in less than a second. Now the way that it works is basically it will take your image and figure out what it should look like without noise and give you the result. And for that reason this denoiser is perfect for RPR. It's very quick and gives you beautiful results. Now let's take a look at a practical example. I'm going to go into Max and show you how to use it. This is actually pretty simple to do. I'm just going to add a V-Ray denoiser render element. And then I'm going to change the denoising engine from the default V-Ray denoiser to the AI denoiser. And there are no settings here, so I'm just going to start the IPR render. 
and Vera is now building the light cache. And after it's done, it's going to start doing the passes. And after a few passes, the, the noiser is going to kick in. So it cleaned the noise quite a bit. Uh, we can actually change the post effects rate to update more quickly. So I'm going to change it to 100. And that means that the NVIDIA denoiser will update as soon as possible. Let's see that in action. Building the light cache and then... And then we switch to the NVIDIA denoiser. So let's start making changes here. I'm going to change the white balance. I'm going to go into the camera settings and enable the auto white balance. Okay, and you can see how quickly that updated. And then I can simply change the glass material. So I already have it selected here. And I'm going to change the fog color. So let me just find it. There it is. And I'm going to change the color to this bluish color. And again, VIR is building the light cache. It has to do that every time. And now the denoiser is kicking in, and you can see that it's almost noise-free, and it's very quick to update. Now let's say that I'm happy with uh, my result. Let me just show you the RGB. This is the denoid result. You can see how clean the refraction is. I'm going to stop the render, and if I'm happy with my result, I can simply switch over to the Vera denoiser. And then render again and do my final render. Okay, so let's now move on to the GPU. Like I said in the beginning, major advances have been made. In fact, these improvements are so significant that we have officially renamed our V-Ray RT render to V-Ray GPU. Different from the CPU engine, the GPU render can take full advantage of all the hardware available on your machine, both the CPUs and the GPUs. It supports the most popular V-Ray capabilities using the same workflow. We have also given it a brand new multi-kernel rendering architecture that makes it nearly twice as fast as before in most cases. The speed boost is very dependent on the graphics card and the scene itself. But probably the first thing that you're going to notice is the new interface. So let me go into Max and show you what we've changed. So I can show you the new UI on an empty scene here. So let me just open the render settings. And here right now I'm using the very next render. I'm going to use the GPU render, so I'm going to switch over to it. And like I said, we renamed it from Vray RT to Vray GPU Next. And here's the settings. Now, first I would like to explain the interactive and production modes. Uh, so right now we are on interactive. But uh, if I go into the settings and start switching between interactive and production, you're going to see that nothing changes. Basically, the settings stay the same. That's because now we can control whether it's production or interactive and the start IPR button will start your interactive render and to start the production you need to click on the render button. Now there are also buttons on the frame buffer as well. So if I open the frame buffer I can show you the two buttons. The start interactive and start production render. And these here are all the settings that relate to V-Ray. And we also have two other tabs, Performance and Settings. And everything is very simple. I'm going to walk you through all of them. Now, the V-Ray tab contains all the settings that relate to noise. Basically, how much time it will take to render the image and how much noise you'll have. Then we have the Override and the Start IPR. We have GI. We can use either Light Cache or Brute Force. Uh, if I switch over to Light Cache, we have settings here for it. And on the brute force, we don't have settings. The only setting that we have is the GI trace depth, which I can change. In this case, I'm not. And I'm going to switch back to light cache. And we have the frame buffer settings as well. We can open it from here. We have options for saving your render. And some other settings as well. There, this is the post effects update rate, the one that we changed in the previous section. And we also have the environment as well. And it's basically the same as in the CPU. So all of these are the same. 
Let me just switch over to performance. Here we have utilization. Uh, you can leave everything by default. We have low GPU thread priority, which means that if you use your graphics card for display purposes, there is going to do some clever things to make your UI not sluggish. We have undersampling as well. A value of 4 or 5 works well. We have the textures management, distributed rendering, and this is the VRA GPU device select. And I have one graphics card here and the CPU. And right now there's a star next to the graphics card's name because I'm using it for display purposes as well. So that's the rendered devices. Let's go to settings. And here we have all the settings that relate to VRA. We have global switches. We have image sampler, color mapping. Uh, we have camera. And here we have the auto exposure and white balance. We have stereoscopic rendering as well. We also have uh, settings for default displacement and proxy preview cache. Now all of these settings are in one place. Uh, but the V-Ray tab is probably the one that you're going to use most. And if I open the render elements here, you will find something very interesting. Uh, if you notice, a lot of the render elements are missing from this menu, and that's because they're not supported on the GPU. And right now, everything that is not supported on the GPU will not be displayed. So let me open the material editor, and you will notice that a lot of the VRA maps are not displayed as well. They're still there, they're just not displayed because they're not supported on the GPU. And the same goes for the materials as well. Now this will take some confusion out of trying to figure out what works on the GPU and what doesn't. That way everything is very simple. Everything that is displayed works. Okay, so let me move on to the next thing. And that's going to be the volumetric rendering on GPU. And in this case, I'm going to take a look at the environment fog. And it's the same environment fog that's supported on the CPU as well. The same options, everything is the same. The result is slightly different that you get on the GPU. But like I said, everything else is the same. So I'm going to go into Max and just show you how it works. Okay, so I have this beautiful scene here that I'm going to use for this example. I'm just going to make sure that I'm on the GPU. And yes, I am. So let me just start the IPR and see what I get from this scene. Okay, so it's going to take a while for V-Ray to load the scene because it's quite big. Uh, while it does that, I'm going to look at the environment settings. And there I'm going to find the environment fog. And here are the settings here. Basically the same settings that you will find on the CPU as well. We have some maps here. Currently they're not supported on the GPU. Uh, but they will be soon. And this is the result that I get right now. So let me activate the fog because there's no fog right now. Okay, nothing happened. That's because I need to change some parameters to force the IPR to update. And I'm going to change the fog distance. And that's basically it. As you can see, it works pretty well. It's a little bit thick for my taste, so let me just change the fog distance again. And I have some other parameters here as well, but I'm going to leave them as they are right now. I'm not going to change anything else. And if I go into the atmosphere render element, I can see what the fog looks like. There's still noise left, but after a while it will be absolutely noise free. I just need to leave it for longer. And that's basically it. I'm going to go back to the RGB. And this is without denoising, and I'm going to switch to the denoiser, and you can see that it's basically noise free. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is the open VDB support which means that right now we can render fluids on the GPU. And again, it's much faster. And let me just show you here. I'm going to load a cache file. And in this case, it's going to be a cloud. And here I have a preview. I'd like to change it because it doesn't give me a good idea what this is. 
So if we can go into the settings here, into the preview settings, I'm going to enable the GPU preview, and that's going to give me a pretty good idea of where the light comes from and stuff like that. So let me just start the interactive render. I'm going to make sure I'm not on the GPU and start the IPR. And as you can see, it's basically instant. It's, it's very, very quick. And the good thing is, is that I can start making some changes here and they're going to update very quick. So let me just go into the options. And maybe, maybe just change the opacity for now and just see how quickly it updates. Like I said, very, very quick. And maybe I can change the scattering to ray traced. Even that didn't slow it down. And maybe color. So I was able to make this very, very quickly. And if I can show you, rotate around it, and it's almost real time. It's, it's very quick. And that's it for the volumetric rendering. I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is the VRA scan support. We have a huge library of over 650 photo bureau materials that we can now use on the GPU. And I just have a very simple scene here. It's this uh, chair. I'm going to show you how to use the scans materials. So I'm going to switch back to the render camera and I would like to apply a scanned material on this object. And the problem right now is that I don't have proper UVs. As you can see here, I've purposefully messed up the UVs just to show you the new feature that we have on the scan material. And that's the triplanar projection mapping. Before I enable it, I would like to show you what it looks like first. So let me go into the render settings here and switch over to the VRA GPU. And then I'm going to just start the IPR. Okay, so VRA is now loading the scene. And the scan materials are quite big, so it can take a while to load them. And let me just expand the frame buffer here so we see better. And here you can see the problems that we now have with the UVs. We have improper tiling, the scale is wrong, and there's all sorts of problems right now. So let me just try and fix them just by clicking on one checkbox. I'm going to go into the scan material and just enable the triplanar mapping. And let's see if that fixed it. I'm going to draw a region here and zoom in. And it seems that that fixed our problems. So these UVs now look great. So by using the triplanar mapping, it's very simple to fix problems like that. And if I go into the coordinates, I can change the tiling here. So basically it's controlled from the tiling options. And I can also use real world size and just input the physical scale from the sample here. And this is basically the size of the sample that was scanned. Or I can use the auto adjust UV tiling to an object button. It's basically gonna do the same thing. But I'm going to leave it as it is for now. And I'm going to use the triplanar mapping, like I said. And uh, let me just stop the render. And the scanned materials now support render elements. So let me just go into the render element section and just add a few render elements. I'm going to add the global illumination, the lighting, and reflection. So let me do another render and see what kind of result we get. And again, it's going to take a while for Vary to load the scene. And this is the production render, so we're going to build light cache. And the light cache is going to look a little bit different because it's built on the CPU. And let me just wait for the render to finish. And I'm just going to take a look at the render elements, and this is the GI. Looks great. 
Let's see the lighting. And yeah, it's how it's supposed to be. And all of these materials are scanned. Let's take a look at the reflection. So in the reflection, we only have this chrome material, which is how it's supposed to be. And I have some other exciting news as well. Our scanning machines are now capable of capturing volumetric translucency. Very soon, we're going to have translucent materials that you can try in our library. And you can see here a test with this gelatin bunny here that we've done. Okay, so next I'm going to show you the new physical hair shader. And uh, it produces great results as you can see in this image here. It's very easy to set up. I'm just going to go into Max and show how it works. I just have a very proxy here. And I have an Alembic loaded here with hair. I'm just going to open the material editor, and this is the material that's applied right now. I just want to show you what it looks like before the hair shader, so I'm going to start the IPR. Okay, so this is what the hair looks like without the hair material. So this is only with the V-Ray multi-standard material. And it doesn't look much like hair right now, but I bet I can turn that around just by applying the Vire Hair Next material. And even though it's still very noisy, you can see that this result is actually quite good. Just by applying the material and using the default values, I get a pretty decent result. Now the hair right now looks very uniform, and I have options here for randomization that will make it look more natural. But first I would like to show you the color controls. And probably the most important color control here is the melanin. It will give the hair a color. And right now the default value is 0.3, which will give this sort of a golden type hair. Now, if I decrease the melanin, it's going to get lighter. So I'm going to draw a render region. I'm just going to decrease the melanin. And this will give me this sort of a blonde type color, very light blonde. It's almost white. It does have a little bit of color, but not much. So decreasing the melanin will basically make your hair lighter. Now if I want to make my hair darker, I can increase my melanin. So that's what I'm going to do next. Let me just draw another render region so we can see the difference between this and the, and the next one. Okay, and I'm going to increase my melanin. And I get this sort of a brown type of color. If I increase it even more, it's going to get even darker. You can see the difference. And there's not much color right now, so I can increase my fail melanin to make my hair look a little bit red. So I can do that. And you see that I've added red just by increasing. And you can see the difference on the same melanin value. And if I increase my melanin, it's going to get darker and it's going to look more red. Okay, so I'm going to increase it even more. And you can see what kind of results I get. Let me just make another render region. And I'm going to increase my melanin all the way to 1. And that's going to make my hair look almost black. Right now there's a little bit red in there because of the fell melanin. But if I lower it, it's going to get almost black. And you can see how many different type of results I got just by changing the fell melanin and melanin controls. So let me just show you the dye color. 
I'm going to decrease my fill melanin to zero and save for the melanin as well. Because that's how you dye hair. You basically bleach it until it's white. And you can see here that it's very white. It's actually over bright right there. That's because my dye color is white. And then I'm going to change it to this dark red sort of color. And this will give me this result. If I want to make this darker, I should increase my melanin. And right now the hair has gotten darker. And if I want more red color in there, I can increase my fail melanin as well. Same as in the previous example. And that will make my hair even redder. And I will increase the melanin even more to get more natural look. Okay, so this looks much better. Let me just change the dye color to something more obvious, like green in this case. And I'm going to decrease the melanin because it's too dark. Okay, so let me change the dye color again to something more saturated. And that's the result that I get. It's uh, a dyed green hair, and it looks very nice. And you can see just by changing three parameters, I was able to get so many different types of hair color. Now let me go into the randomization parameters. And here are some of them. We actually have a lot. And basically all the parameters that we have up there have random values here. So I'm gonna draw another render region and just change the, some of the random values to see what happens. And as you can see, I get random hair strands with random color, random uh, dye hue. Let me change all of them. Let me add a little bit of randomness to everything and see what happens. Okay, so right now my hair looks very random, actually. I have some white hairs in there as well, if you can see. So this looks very nice. Let me just remove the dye color and see what it will look like with the melanin and fail melanin color controls. And we've kept some of the white hairs. And you see that it looks very similar, but just different in terms of color. So what I can do right now is to basically stop the render, remove my render region, and I'm going to increase the melanin and fail melanin. And just render the whole hair. I want to see what it looks like. And this is a beautiful result. And just by randomly changing values, I was able to get this very natural looking result. You can see the randomization options really did make this hair look very, very natural. Okay, so that's all about the hair. Let me move on to the next thing. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the lighting analysis tools. We have an improved very light meter helper. I'm going to show you how to use it. And we also have a very lighting analysis render element. So let me go into Max. I have a scene loaded here, and it should be familiar. This is the scene from the dome light. And then I'm going to go into Helpers, V-Ray. And I'm going to draw a light meter helper. And these are the parameters here. And I'm not going to go into detail. They're very easy to understand. And if I click on the Calculate button, it's going to calculate the light in that particular area. But what if I want to calculate the light for everything that I see? Well, I'm going to need to add the lighting analysis render element, so let me do that. We have different types of measuring units. I can also change the scale. I can display false colors or grid overlays. 
And if I choose grid overlay, I'm going to have options for resolution, basically, for horizontal and vertical spacing. Leave it full scholars for now. And I can also draw a legend, so I'm going to do that. And let me just do a render and see what kind of result I get. And this is the lighting analysis render element. And right now it's white. That's because I need to change the maximum value. And I'm going to input 7000 here. And click on update. Okay, so that looks better. And by right clicking, I can see the values at each point. And this is the legend here. And that's how the false colors look. Let me show you the grid overlay. And I just get points, and at each point I get a value. And if I increase the spacing, I get less points. And if I de decrease the spacing, I will get more points. All right, so this particular one is 8,000. And that's all about the Light Mirror Helper. Let me move on to the noising render elements. This was probably one of the most requested features, and I'm happy to tell you that we have it now, and it's very simple to use. So let me go into Max, and uh, I'm going to use the same scene here. I'm not going to switch over to another one. And let me just remove the lighting analysis render element. And I'm going to add two global illumination render elements. And one of them I'm going to leave by default, and the other I'm going to denoise. And there's a checkbox down there that I can click. And right now, nothing's going to happen. I need to add a very denoiser render element as well. And all the settings that I input here are going to be the settings for denoising the GI in this case. And let me just rename it so I know it's the one that's going to be denoised. And I actually already have this rendered, so I'm going to go into Nuke and show you. So this is my raw render, and I purposefully made it look a little bit washed out, just so we are able to see the noise better. And let me just focus on this area here, because the noise is very easily visible here. And this is the denoised RGB, and as you can see, it's uh, much, much better. And uh, this area is pretty noise-free. In fact, the entire image is noise-free. But I told you that we now are able to denoise render elements, so let me show you. Now this is the GI with noise, and this is the denoised one, and same goes for lighting. Reflection, refraction, specular, let me just show you. And the refraction is going to be difficult to see, so let me just focus in on this area. And I don't know if you're able to see the difference, it's very slight. Okay, so let me just compare the denoised RGB against the denoised render element. And there's a difference in the background. I just haven't put the background in. That doesn't matter. I'm just going to focus in this area here. And you can see how much less detail I have in the denoised RGB versus the render element. So the render elements keep a lot more detail. I don't know how much you're able to see, but it's a bit blurred.
and it's very easy to see in this area. So the great thing about having the noise render elements is that now I can just simply put a great note in there and start making some changes, both to the GI and uh, I'm going to do some changes to the lighting as well. And that's basically it. I'm going to move on to the materials and explain the metalness roughness workflow. The metalness is something new that we've added to the very material. And this is going to be very helpful, especially to people coming from gaming backgrounds. Let's say that you want to replicate some of your PBR materials. There's a possible workflow and uh, I'm going to show you how to do it. For this example, I'm going to go on Substance Designer and show you how it's done. So I have a material here in Substance Designer and it's a metal material from the library. It's this metal O3 material. And I have a few maps here to export from it. This is the diffuse, normal, roughness, metalness, height maps. And I use this uh, save current images bitmap button. I've already done that. So I have the, all the maps saved. Let me go into max and try to replicate this material. So I have a scene here that's very similar to the one in Substance Designer. I'm going to start the IPR and see what kind of result I get. Okay, so this is the result. I'm using the same HDR as in the Substance Designer for lighting. I'm going to open the Material Editor and try to replicate this material. This is the standard VRA material that I'm going to use to try to replicate the material from Substance Designer. And I'm going to start with the diffuse. So let me just get the diffuse map from Substance Designer and load it into the material. And this is the result that I'm getting. And I'm also going to change the reflection to white. And I'm going to change the metalness to 1. And this is the result that I'm getting right now. It's this chrome-like material, 100% reflective. It's a little bit dirty because of the diffuse. And then I'm going to switch to the roughness workflow. It's in the BRDF roughness. And I'm going to change the roughness to 0. So I get the same result as with the glossiness. And then I'm going to import a roughness map. I'm going to use the VRA HDR to load it. And here I'm going to load the roughness map from Substance Designer. And the result that I'm getting is very similar to the one in Substance Designer. Let me just check to see if I'm correct. Yes, it looks very similar. Let me go back to Max, and all I need to do is load the normal map into the bump slot. So that's exactly what I'm going to do next. Again, I'm going to use the V-Ray HDR. And here, just load the normal map. And here I'm going to load the height map, again from Substance Designer. I'm going to use the V-Ray HDR. And all that is left now is just to change the multiplier to 100. And that's basically it. This material should look very similar to the one in Substance Designer. And I think it does. I think they're pretty similar. Okay, so that's basically it. Let me move on to the next thing. I would like to say a few words about the V-Ray Cloud service that is still in development. The idea is to be built right into V-Ray, so you do not have to install anything. When you're ready to render, you simply click on the cloud icon and you submit your render. If you do that now, you'll get to this page where you can apply for access. When you register and get access, you will have lots of options for preview and notifications so you can follow the job progress. While it's rendering, you can continue working on your computer. When your job is done, you can download the results. 
And here I have a short video to show you what the cloud looks like in action. Here's the cloud button that I was talking about. When you click it, you get this dialog and here you have options for resolution. You have options for preview. And this will show me what the cloud will actually render. And if I'm happy with my results, I can submit the job. which will take me to our cloud page. And here I can change the job name. I can, I can create a new project and rename it. I have options for resolution, aspect ratio, and output format. I can then submit my job. And when it's done, I can view it. And when it's done, I can download the results, like I said. And here I have some other tabs for my projects and my resources and stuff like that. And that covers the major features and updates to Vary Next. We have also updated the Adaptive Lights algorithm, and that made a significant speed boost in scenes with lots of light sources. Here you can see a comparison between Vary 3.6 and Vray Next. We also have a new switch material, which makes it easy to switch between materials on the same object. You can have a few different material setups. If you want to switch between them, you can simply change a switch value. Another important update is the ability to disconnect the DR hosts if they finish early. So let's say that you have 10 machines rendering, and towards the end of the render, 9 of them have finished and only one is still rendering. Before next, the 9 free machines will have to wait for the last one to finish before they move on to the next job or frame. But now Vary will disconnect them and they will be free to do other tasks. And we have lots of other improvements as well. We support layer dynamic workflows, we have language tooltips in different languages and more. Uh, let's recap. I've talked about what makes Vray smarter, and by now I'm sure that you know that that's the adaptive dome light, and the physical camera and its auto settings for exposure and white balance, the NVIDIA AI denoiser, and since these are major features, they work on both the CPU and the GPU. And by gathering scene intelligence, Vray Next is able to not just make your work as an artist easier, but also to speed things up quite a bit. When you combine the adaptive dome light with the NVIDIA AI denoiser, you can get noise-free renders in seconds. And the speed improvements do not stop there. Vray and X have been almost completely rewritten, making it modern and optimized, which means that just by using it, you can get up to 25% speed boost. And it's even better for the Vray and X GPU. With its multi-kernel rendering architecture, it can speed things up for you quite a bit, almost two times. And with its new UI, we believe that it will speed up your workflow as well. But what good will all that speed be without the new tools that we have available, like the hair and switch materials, the lighting analysis, the updates to the various scans, the GPU environment fog, and VDB support? I still have a little bit of time left, so let me finish with a video from one of our clients. I wanted to show it to you before, when I was demonstrating the volumetric rendering on GPU, but I was afraid that it will eat up too much of my time. And to be honest, given the content, it's very appropriate for ending. If you want more information, here are some useful links to follow. And if you would like to try Vary Next for 30 days, you can download it from the link here. If you have more questions for my colleagues, they will be here answering a while longer, so don't be afraid to ask us anything. Thank you and goodbye.